Thanks, Thanks very, very much. much. Uh, thank, thank you very, you very much for the invitation uh, to, to be here. here. It's, it's my first, first visit to Israel and to Tel Aviv, so it's, it's a great, great pleasure, pleasure to be here and, and to meet many of you uh, and, and to enjoy, enjoy the meeting. meeting. Um, um, so, so I'm going to be talking, talking about, about our work, work using, using uh, mainly using brain imaging to study adaptive plasticity. So my group are interested in how the brain changes with changes in experience, and we study this in many different contexts so what happens when uh, children acquire new skills uh, when we as adults uh, acquire new skills if we change our lifestyles such as changing our um, physical activity or sleep habits and also how our brains adapt to alterations in our body or alterations or damage to our brains so for today i'm just going to focus on a couple of different sets of experiments um, as a subset of this overall program of research I'm going to be telling you about some of our work um, on structural plasticity, where we've been particularly interested in understanding white matter plasticity across different spatial scales. And then for the second half, to talk to you about some of our work uh, studying functional remapping of um, body representations. So with our work on structural plasticity, as I said, we've been interested in um, the possibility of uh, myelin plasticity. So we're interested in this question of where does plasticity happen in the brain. We're all familiar with the idea of synaptic plasticity, so the canonical textbook form of plasticity through mechanisms such as LTP or LTD, where we get alterations in the uh, synaptic strength as a consequence of experience. These are very well studied uh, plasticity phenomena that we very well know underlie learning and memory in the brain. But it's increasingly uh, becoming clear that plasticity is not limited to the synapse. So there are other ways in which our brains change their structure and function as a consequence of experience. And we've been interested in the possibility that the, the myelinated axon in the brain is an alternative site for plasticity that can be complementary to the classical synaptic plasticity that we understand so well. And our first um, hint of, in our lab that, that white matter or myelin plasticity uh, might occur in response to changes in experience is this study that my student at the time, Jan Schultz, uh, did um, some years ago now, in which we used uh, structural MRI and diffusion MRI to study how brain structure changes as a result of new skill learning in adults, in healthy adults. And what we did in this experiment was scan people's brains, uh, uh, and then teach them a new skill, in this case, learning to juggle, and then scan them again six weeks later after they had uh, practiced this skill daily for six weeks. When we can compare those brain scans over time, we found changes that had occurred as a result of that training experience, and that the changes that you see are illustrated on the brain scan there, where you can see in red that we saw in the cortex evidence for increase in the volume of the gray matter, and interestingly, these were in areas in the medial parts of the occipital and parietal cortex, regions that are important, uh, are involved in uh, visuomotor integration, and in particular in uh, reaching and grasping for objects in the periphery of visual space. So a function that's particularly relevant given the specific skill of juggling that's being trained here. So we find changes in the cortex, as had been previously described at that time. But then the novel observation at that time was the blue cluster that you see, which shows changes in the microstructure of the underlying white matter pathways. And this was based on a measure we can calculate from diffusion MRI, a measure called fractional anisotropy, or FA, which captures the directional dependence of water diffusion in tissue. So what this study showed then is that healthy human adults, uh, the, the white matter in healthy human adults is susceptible to experience-dependent structural change. When we learn something new, it changes the structure not only of our cortex, but also of uh, underlying white matter pathways. So that's intriguing, but obviously raises many, many questions. So what on earth does this imaging measure reflect in terms of uh, the underlying uh, cellular structures? What is changing to give rise to the change in this imaging parameter? Well, unfortunately, like, any, like many of our MRI measures, this metric of FA is not a specific measure of a particular feature in the biology that we're interested in. There are many different cellular changes that could give rise to an alteration in FA. And this cartoon just illustrates some of those many scenarios. So as we move from the top to the bottom in each of these uh, columns of scenarios, if you were to increase the packing density of axons 
or to reduce the diameter of axons or to increase the uh, coherence of an axon bundle, all of those changes in the geometrical properties of our fibre bundle could give rise to an increase in this MRI measure of FA. Or over on the right-hand side, if there were changes in the myelination of, that, um, uh, of those axons. So for example, if there were formation of myelin on previously unmyelinated axons, or if there were thickening or remodeling of myelin on previously myelinated axons. Again, any of these changes could give rise to an increase in FA because they would alter the directional dependence of water diffusion. And using diffusion imaging alone, we can't differentiate between those different possibilities. So one thing that we've done in the lab um, over the past uh, 10 years or so is, is establish a parallel program in rodents in whom we can acquire the same MRI metrics, but then also measure or manipulate myelin in more specific ways in order to get a clearer biological interpretation of, of what might be going on. So just to summarize then a series of studies that we've done on the rodent side, many of which um, support the idea that the changes that we're seeing in FA might reflect experience dependent myelin plasticity. So um, this is a summary of some work uh, done by Cassandra Sampa Baptista when she was a graduate student and postdoc in the lab and she's now a, uh, an associate professor in uh, Glasgow University in the UK and she spent many years training rats on a new motor task in this case a skilled reaching task so a very well studied well established task in which you train rats or mice to use a single paw to reach uh, for a food pellet in a constrained way and if you train them on this task over 10 days, you see a nice learning curve as they gradually acquire this very specific uh, motor skill. And it had previously been shown that this motor skill training causes functional reorganization within the motor cortex, changes the neuronal representation within the motor cortex. And what we were looking at was whether this skill training also changed uh, the structure of the white matter in motor pathways. So following 10 days of training on this task, uh, Cassandra scanned the animals post-mortem using diffusion MRI. And what we found, as you can see in the brain scan image there, is the area in red where there was greater FA in skilled trained animals compared to various control groups, specifically in the white matter underlying the trained motor cortex. So if you like, this is the rodent equivalent of the human juggling result that I showed you earlier. But then obviously the whole point of doing this study in rodents is that we could then follow up and more directly probe the myelin, in this case using immunohistochemistry to stain for myelin basic protein in the same animals in the same area of white matter and found that there was indeed an increase in myelin density in that same area of white matter, suggesting that the changes that we're seeing on the MR in this context in part reflect um, activity dependent myelin plasticity. And then we've subsequently followed up, for example, using <coughs> serial in vivo MRI longitudinally uh, as animals acquire the task, in this case using another kind of MRI scan, magnetization transfer ratio, which is a more myelin-specific metric, and again showing changes over time in those same white matter pathways. We've looked at somatosensory experience effects in rodents and found that as there's uh, repeated days of experience with somatosensory discrimination using the whiskers, there's change in the white matter in large areas of white matter underlying sensory cortex. And then if we look at gene expression of a number of candidate genes, uh, some of which are related to myelination, we find an increase in expression of myelin basic protein associated again with that change in somat somatosensory experience. So taken all together then, these studies suggest that uh, in adult humans or rodents, when we train or experience a new, um, have a, uh, train on a new skill or have different experiences, that changes the microstructure of white matter pathways that are relevant to those experiences. And that at least in part, those changes that we're seeing on MR seem to reflect um, activity dependent myelin change. But obviously all of these uh, examples are observational. They show us that a change in myelin is associated with a change in behavior, but they can't tell us whether the change in myelin was causally necessary for the behavior to, for the learning to take place. So to do that, we need to interfere in some way with the processes of, learn, of myelin plasticity. 
So we've done some work on this in collaboration with uh, Bill Richardson's lab at UCL. So Bill's group um, some years previously had published this nice study using uh, conditional transgenic mice in whom they allow for normal developmental myelination to take place and then they use a tamoxifen induced conditional genetic knockout to interfere with myelin regulatory factor which is involved in oligodendrogenesis in the production of new myelin forming cells in adulthood. And what they'd shown previously is that this genetic knockout uh, reduces the production of new myelin, as you would expect, but also behaviorally impairs behavior on this complex wheel running task, which they used. So this is uh, a running wheel that you have in the cage of the rodents, but the running wheel has irregularly spaced runs. So it takes the animals a few days to learn how to run quickly on this complex running wheel with irregular rung spacing. And you can see that the knockouts in red run more slowly than the controls in blue. So we followed up using this same transgenic line for lots of various different follow-up studies in, in much larger numbers to truly really try to understand whether this is a learning deficit or just a, a running deficit. Uh, and this is some work from my um, student and post at Malta Kala, which he, the preprint was just uploaded last week, um, in which we were able to replicate this original finding but also, importantly to us at least, demonstrate that it really does appear to be a learning deficit in that what we see is a, is a day by genotype interaction. It's the slope of the behavior change, which is the definition of learning, which is altered in the knockouts compared to the controls. So interfering with this process of adult oligodendrogenesis impairs the animal's ability to uh, improve their performance on a complex motor skill. Uh, there's lots of other things that I could tell you about those, those models if anyone's interested and in that we did find in this uh, recent study that the particular models also imp uh, seem to interfere with background processes and myelin maintenance, which raises lots of questions as to how we might use these models in the context of understanding plasticity and learning. Okay, so there appears to be activity-dependent myelin change in association with um, behavioral uh, learning that's interesting, but raises lots of questions as to how this, myelin uh, how this plasticity mechanism might work. So coming back to synaptic plasticity, as I mentioned earlier, there's obviously a huge literature on synaptic plasticity. We understand well the molecular mechanisms involved. We also understand well the learning rules that processes like LTP and LTD follow. But in the case of myelin plasticity, we don't know, any we don't know anything about the learning rules that this putative plasticity mechanism might follow. We know that active axons are preferentially myelinated, but we don't know what are the rules that govern that, uh, act, that preferential myelination. So for example, one of the classical rules which governs synaptic plasticity is uh, Hebb's rule. Uh, so it can be summarized as cells that fire together, wire together, or more formally, we know that synaptic plasticity follows Hebbian rules, which means that it's synaptic plasticity is spike timing dependent and relies on coincidence detection. So our brains only strengthen synapses where impulses are arriving in quick succession in connected neurons. Does, do those similar rules apply in the context of myelin plasticity or not? So the field doesn't know the answer to these questions. We've started trying to understand, trying to probe some of these questions in our first step in trying to probe some of these questions is some work done by Alberto Lazari, who is a student in the lab, uh, and he um, set out to address this question in an experiment in humans in which we wanted to see, test whether myelin plasticity follows Hebbian rules. So the way in which we did this was to use a combination of methods. So first of all, we used um, a particular form of transcranial magnetic stimulation, or TMS, to induce plasticity in a pathway. So uh, briefly, what we do here is use two TMS coils. So this is just a way of non-invasively stimulating the cortex using uh, magnetic fields, very well-established technique. Uh, we were using it in a well-established, well-described way called paired associative TMS, where you, you have two, cool, two coils placed over interconnected cortical areas. In this case, the ventral premotor cortex of one hemisphere and the primary motor cortex of the other hemisphere. And it's been previously well established that if you apply pairs of pulses to those two regions, you can induce plasticity in that functional pathway. 
If you apply those two pulses in quick succession, the protocol on the left there in green, a so-called Hebbian protocol, then you induce functional plasticity in the pathway. If you apply the same two pulses separated out in time, a non-Hebbian protocol, you don't induce functional plasticity in the pathway. And it's been previously shown that this paired associative TMS in the short term induces functional plasticity. So we used that protocol and then we probed the effect of that plasticity induction using TMS in a different way uh, before and after the plasticity induction. So here we're using the, the kind of simplest form of TMS, so a single pulse of TMS over the motor cortex to measure the excitability of the motor cortex. So we use that as our readout of the plasticity induction uh, where we're calculating the change in um, motor cortical excitability pre-post TMS. Um, what we find just using the physiological data is that uh, as expected, that paired associative TMS protocol induces functional plasticity in the motor cortex such that the Hebbian protocol in green uh, makes the motor cortex more excitable, whereas the non-Hebbian control protocol doesn't. So then the question is, to what extent is this physiological plasticity associated with uh, myelin plasticity? So to probe myelin plasticity, we used uh, MT. So again, that myelin sensitive MRI measure, which we acquire across the whole brain uh, as our measure of myelin before and after the plasticity induction. So then we can quantify the change in myelin as a, if, uh, as a consequence of the plasticity induction. And then we can ask, across the whole brain, uh, are there areas where the change in myelin correlates with the physiological, uh, with the change in excitability of the motor cortex? And what we find is these areas of white matter here, which are among the pathways that are connecting the ventral premotor and the motor cortex, where across this uh, region, functional plasticity correlates with myelin plasticity, specifically in the Hebbian uh, condition. So here's the data that underlie those clusters, which show you that uh, those subjects that show the greatest physiological plasticity in response to the plasticity induction also show uh, the greatest myelin change, suggesting that um, in this context, at least, myelin plasticity does indeed seem to care about uh, Hebbian type um, learning rules. So it would be really interesting to, for those colleagues who do much more sophisticated manipulation of cellular level plasticity mechanisms to be able to probe these questions in far greater detail uh, at the cellular level to, to really understand the learning rules that are driving this phenomenon of myelin plasticity. So in summary then for that first part, experience shapes white matter microstructure in the human brain, but relating those gross changes to the underlying biology is challenging. But from the animal studies, we can see that, at least in part, those imaging changes seem to reflect myelin plasticity, which appears to follow Hebbian rules. So for the, ne for the next part, I want to tell you about some of our work on functional plasticity of body maps, where we've used high-resolution um, 7 Tesla uh, fMRI, um, in this case, to map individual digit representations in the human brain. So this is work from James Kolosinski, who was a PhD student in the lab at the time, and he used um, high-resolution fMRI to, uh, with a so-called phase encoding paradigm where he had subjects repetitively move the fingers of their hand uh, in order to map the individual digit representations in the central sulcus. And you can see an example here of single subject data where we see this beautiful uh, individual level mapping. Uh, and this kind of topography that you see here with the four digits represented up the central sulcus is very well preserved across many different individuals that we've scanned in this way. But interestingly, what we found is that although that topography is well preserved, the very precise size and shape of each of these maps varies quite a bit between individuals, but is very stable within an individual. So we then wanted to ask, so given that these maps are fairly stable in your brains, how can we change the maps? Under what circumstances can we change these functional maps? within an individual. So to do that, we brought people into the lab for four different brain scans uh, separated by 24-hour periods. And in those 24-hour periods, subjects were either left to go about their business as usual, or else we glued together the first two digits of their fingers using a special surgical glue, which could be easily removed uh, the next day. And then the question is, 
So if I glue together your fingers for 24 hours, obviously that will change the way you use those fingers quite dramatically over that 24 hour period. To what extent does that change in sensory motor experience change your digit representations? And those of you who are familiar with the non-human primate classical literature in brain plasticity might think this seems a bit familiar because there were many studies done in which uh, digits were sutured together in non-human primates over much, much longer periods of time and then electrophysiological mapping done to look at the effects of that on cortex. And those classical experiments would cause us to predict that if we glue together digits two and three, cortically that should fuse together the cortical representations of those digits. Interestingly though, with this short-term manipulation in humans, that's not what we found. What we found is um, illustrated here, where on the y-axis you're seeing the uh, amount of overlap between the cortical maps for each of the pairs of digits uh, for all of our different scanning conditions. And what you see is that, as we'd expect, the control conditions are very similar to one another, which is what we had established. Everything, but things change in the following the gluing condition. But the way in which they change was somewhat surprising in that the glued fingers don't change their overlap with each other. But what changes is that three and four we see less overlap and four and five, we see more overlap. So it's the other fingers that you're using in a different way which change their cortical relationships with each other. So what we actually observe then as you glue together two and three is that three and four move apart and four and five move together. So this is intriguing and also led us to predict that if this is what's happening in the brain, then we might make predictions about what effect those cortical changes might have on behavior. What we might predict is that um, for those cortical, uh, for those regions that show greater overlap uh, following gluing, subjects might get worse at differentiating tactile inputs to those uh, areas because of greater confusion between the signals. Whereas for, for digits that get further apart, subjects might get better at differentiating those inputs. So we tested that prediction in a separate experiment on new subjects where we used a so-called temporal order judgment task to assess how good subjects were at differentiating tactile inputs to pairs of digits. And what we found in that behavioral task uh, fitted that prediction. So for the digit pairs where we saw less cortical overlap, there's better discrimination in the tactile inputs. Where we saw more overlap, there's worse discrimination. So this suggests then that short-term changes in experience evoke rapid and behaviorally relevant remapping in the cortex. But for the last two minutes, I'll show you how the basic topography of cortical digit maps is remarkably resilient to altered experience. And this is work that we've done from Tamar Makin, a colleague who uh, moved from Israel to the UK some years ago now, spent time in my lab and is now a professor in Cambridge. And we were interested in amputation, where the prevailing model is that when you remove inputs to a region, you get invasion of neighboring body parts. But we, uh, Tamar showed very uh, creatively that actually there's a very preserved representation of the missing limb in the case of individuals with phantom limb sensations. So we have many studies which show this. Here's one example where you can see that the functional cortical representation of a phantom limb is just as strong as my representation of my intact limb. So there is a preserved functional representation of a phantom limb we then wanted to ask how, how organized is that preserved functional representation. So we've done that using this single digit mapping protocol that I told you about before. Here we have five fingers represented, so there are five colors. You can see here that example in, in two controls. We've then scanned a small number of amputees who unusually have very vivid phantom sensations such that they can move individual phantom digits and are also safe to go in our seven Tesla scanner. And what we found is that those individuals have just as much, just as organized these uh, topography of these cortical digit maps with individual digit representations of phantom digits that have been missing for 20 or 30 years. So in summary then, although short-term changes can rapidly remap these cortical representations, the basic topography is remarkably resilient to altered experience. So in summary, experience shapes the structure and function of the human brain. Structurally, uh, we think that white matter plasticity may reflect activity-dependent myelination, which obeys Hebbian rules. And functionally, 
we see these short-term behaviorally relevant changes in cortical maps, but that basic topography is, is remarkably resilient. So thank you very much for your attention and very happy to take questions. Thanks for a wonderful talk. Um, I have two questions. One of them really gets the issue of what myelin is doing. So is it just enhancing the overall strength of the connectivity, or is there timing which is changing such that you enhance the response because you have um, you know, some effects which converge at a temporal level? Um, the, second question, the second question gets at the issue of the plasticity in the maps that you were describing. So Leo Cohen has shown that you can do TMS with movement of the thumb and change the representation within minutes. So one question I had in relation to your study with the overlap in the D4, D5, and D3 was whether or not you had done a task where there was, um, for those subjects, a different sort of interaction. Yeah, so great question. So for the second question, we did do a task. We didn't see any effect on the task, so we did... Um, in terms of the, so we saw the, we saw the um, temporal order judgment difference that you saw. On, in terms of movement output, uh, we didn't see a clear change in movement output. What we saw was a change in tactile discrimination in those tasks. One thing that I think would be super interesting is to understand what is it about the change in behaviour. So we have no measurement of what they were doing in that 24-hour period. I think you know you could have these various inst instrumented devices that they would wear for those 24 hours to actually track how the um, cooperation behaviorally between the digits changes over time. And I suspect that's what's driving the changes that we're seeing. But we, it's, it's invisible to us, that 24 hour period. But I think that's what's going on. For your first question on what's the myelin doing, I think that's a really good question. And we don't know from our data. So obviously, you know, we all know that more myelin speeds up conduction. But, and there are some contexts in which learning might be helped by faster conduction, but that's often not the case. So it's often more an optimization of speed and getting the timing right in terms of when signals are appearing in different locations. So we don't know. I mean, I suspect that it makes a big difference what task you're probing as to whether or not myelin plasticity would be induced. You can imagine that with a task like juggling, you're having a lot of, you're having a lot more cortico-cortical communication between sensory motor integration areas and parietal areas such that those pathways are just working harder and might get more myelin both from a kind of maintenance because I guess the, the myelin is maintaining the axons as well as speeding conduction time but yeah we don't, we don't know how the functionality of the myelin is helping there are interesting models where people are trying to understand the physiological effects of different changes in myelin morphology which would be really interesting to link in had a question for you. Yeah, hi. So what exactly is the Hebbian plasticity when it comes to uh, axons and myelin? Yeah, I mean, in terms of what the mechanism is, I think that's a, a huge question that we can't answer. So what it suggests, so if myelin plasticity follows Hebbian rules, it suggests that there's some way in which the oligodendrocytes know about the downstream consequences of action potentials that are passing down those axons which could be manifest by some kind of backward signal. So you could have coincidence detection happening at the synapse and then somehow that's being signaled back along the axons that transmitted those original impulses and then the oligos are hearing about it then. Um, or it could be that if you've got oligodendrocytes uh, wrapping multiple different axons that from their different branches they're detecting the coincidence directly from the action. So there's NMDA receptors on oligodendrocytes so we don't know the mechanism but yeah it could either be via the synapse by, via those coincidence detection mechanisms that we know exist at the synapse somehow telling the oligo or, or more directly all right thank you so much thank you